Now coming into our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1179 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Removal of amateur satellite allocations are at the forefront of a new proposal. Many amateur radio organizations were represented at the 2021 AWRL New England Division Convention. International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System says interference from Radio France International is untenable. The state of Georgia gets a new section manager, and re-elected section managers began new terms on October 1st. In other International Amateur Radio Union news, we will hear the president of the IARU say that he's getting tired of meeting virtually and that the organization is looking to expand digital segments on the low bands. Youngsters in South Africa celebrate a day of national heritage on the air. A unique special event station is coming up to celebrate the world's largest, are you ready, horseshoe crab. And we will tell you about the quietest RF spot in the United States. All of that and a lot more is straight ahead in this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will tell us how William Shatner, Star Trek's Captain Kirk, is scheduled to go into space. He will talk about mobile apps that spy on you and the European General Data Protection Regulation and the future predicted by the novel 1984, Leo says is here, as your phone has become both a friend and an enemy. Australia's own Arnold Benshoff, VK6FLAB, says that the sun shines on our hobby in unexpected ways. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes a look at the development and the beginnings of amateur radio call signs. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about the best ways to support a coax run on your tower. And in a flashback report from the mid-80s, we will hear an interview with K7UGA. That's Barry Goldwater. And he will be in a discussion with Roy Neal, K6DUE, on his feelings about Morris Code and the then upcoming No Code proposal. We will also hear a short commentary by Blair Alper, KA9SEQ. All of that is straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our UV-lit and disinfected studio here in a very nondescript building in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS, where the fall colors keep on coming a little more every week. And reporting this week from my home studio in Cortlandville, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from the western Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where our fall fantasies are finally fulfilled at the farm level, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our Trey New York News Bureau, where this week the heat went on for the first time, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where autumn, after being rejected by summer, has returned with a vengeance, bringing rain, thunderstorms, and long-expected cooler weather. And I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, very grateful for falling temperatures. Ah, yes, fall has fell. And now with our lead story, here is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. According to the AMSAT News Service, 
A proposal to give radio astronomy operations use of frequencies between 300 megahertz and 2,000 megahertz within the shielded zone of the moon would remove amateur satellite allocations at 435 megahertz and 1260 megahertz for communications such as those with Lunar Oscar 93 and Lunar Oscar 94, two amateur satellites currently in lunar orbits. The proposed changes by the Space Frequency Coordination Group, reported in the online journal Inside Global Navigation Satellite System, would also apply to Mars. According to the article in the journal, the purpose of the proposal is to protect radio astronomy from RF interference. The article identifies several affected projects already in the works, including one from China that would include between five and eight satellites forming a radio astronomy antenna array in orbit around the moon. This year's Northeast Ham Exposition drew about 1,200 attendees to its new location in Marlboro, Massachusetts during September 10th to the 12th weekend. The event hosted the ARRL New England Division Convention and was formally held about 15 miles away in Boxborough, Massachusetts. This was the first year the convention was held at this location because the event was canceled last year due to the pandemic. Event proceeds go to the New England Femera Scholarship Fund, which helps students attend a college or trade school of their choice. Scholarships are administered by the ARRL Foundation Scholarship Program. Ham Exposition Chairman Bob DiMattia, K1IW, and his committee said they were pleased with the turnout given last year's cancellation and this year's new venue. The event was held at the Best Western Royal Plaza Hotel and Trade Center in Marlboro. Although there were some last-minute cancellations from a handful of exhibitors and presenters, W1QSL Bureau co-manager Eric Williams, KV1J, believed there was remarkably good attendance despite the concerns of COVID-19. The W1QSL Bureau team included ARRL Director of Operations, Bob Nauman, W5OV, who checked DXCC and other ARRL award applications throughout the convention. In addition to ARRL Vice President Mike Raisbeck, K1TWF, and New England Division Director Fred Hopengarden, K1VR, the 2021 ARRL convention team included New England Division Vice Director Phil Temples, K9HI, Field Services Manager Mike Walters, W8ZY, Senior Member Services Representative Kim McNeil, KM1IPA, Director of Operations Bob Nauman, W5OV, and Public Relations and Innovation Director Bob Inderbitzen, NQ1R. Several section managers and other field organization volunteers also supported the convention. Raisbeck and Temples also served as the convention's vice chair and program chair, respectively. The Nashua Area Radio Society of New Hampshire demonstrated a variety of activities to encourage new licensees to become radioactive. The Nashua Area Radio Society was among several radio clubs and organizations that staffed visitor booths at the event. Members of the Women Radio Operators of New England hosted an exhibit for the Young Ladies Radio League, represented by Barbara Irby, KC1KGS, and Ann Manna, WB1ARU, from YLRL District 1. These organizations encourage and assist women entering the amateur radio service. The SciTech Amateur Radio Society of New England in Natick, Massachusetts, offered a hands-on exhibit and conducted a youth panel. The SciTech Amateur Radio Society is hosted by the STEM Education Center and Makerspace at New England SciTech. DXCC and contest dinner speaker Adrian Chuperka, KO8SCA, recapped the DXpedition and IARU contest activities and activations from Market Reef and Oland Islands. On Saturday, the banquet speaker was Philip J. Erickson, W1PJE, of Haystack Observatory, operated by Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Erickson discussed HamSci's latest ionospheric science investigations, supported in partnership with radio amateurs and scientists from Haystack Observatory and other institutions. The ARRL leadership team hosted an ARRL membership forum on Saturday. ARRL Washington Council Dave Sadal, K3ZJ, was among the attendees. Inderbitzen's keynote address on Saturday morning included a tribute to the September 11th attacks and a color guard supported by the local Boy Scouts of America. He also attended the youth panel and met with many young hams, parents, and their advisors throughout the event, including Olin College of Engineering undergraduate Zachary Sherman, KC1NXK, who exhibited for Olin Collegiate Amateur Radio Club, KC1LHR. Over the past 18 months, a proposal for an IARU HF digital mode reorganization has been undertaken by representatives of all three IARU regions. 
In a report, IARU Region 1 says that the objectives were to review the data modes usage of the amateur radio HF spectrum and propose changes that reduce intermode conflict between dissimilar operating modes and facilitate the expansion of new technologies. In conducting the review, it was realised that it was necessary to update the manner in which the IARU creates its band plans. Accordingly, the IARU's band planning definition toolkit was redefined, and additional data mode definition characteristics have been added to help separate activities that are fundamentally incompatible within the data mode family. With the band planning process updated, the proposal then revised the band plans of all three IARU regions, focusing on the data subbands and taking into consideration such matters as popularity and capacity requirements, existing band users, and intermode compatibility assessments. The team also took the opportunity to harmonize the band plans of all three IAR regions to the greatest extent possible. The proposal is now being discussed in the relevant committees. The changes proposed include a significant expansion of the data mode segments. A working document can be seen at www.iaru-r3conf2021.org. That's www.iaru-r3conf2021.org. And comprising a number of slides, the document can be found on that website near the bottom of the Input Documents page. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System August Newsletter reports that Radio France International was active daily between 2100 and 2200 UTC on 7205 kHz. The report says splattering appeared massively down to 7186 kHz, which the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System called an untenable condition. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 monitoring system said that the especially well-known intruders included voice of broad masses on 7140 and 7180 kilohertz from Eritrea. From time to time, China Radio International was heard on 14,000 kilohertz and intermodulation of 13,855 kilohertz and 13,710 kilohertz. The usual players among the over-the-horizon radar systems were active almost daily. These included the Russian container system, the British Pluto from Cyprus, and the Foghorn over-the-horizon radar from China. Intruders monitored in Region 1 may be causing problems elsewhere in the world as well. IARU band planners have been looking at using bandwidth as a defining transmission characteristic following the revision of the tools used to describe HF amateur band plans. A joint tri-region IARU committee developed a proposal for revision of data segments in the HF amateur band plans. The changes proposed include a significant expansion of digital mode segments. These revisions address several areas, including global HF amateur band plan segment harmonization. Other factors include separation of so-called conversational and time-synchronized digital activity, band plan segment expansions in support of time-synchronized transmission mode capacity demands, mostly trading with now lesser used RTTY subbands, and more effective separation of voice and data modes on 40 meters. More information is on the IARU Region 3 conference website. Georgia gets a new section manager. Re-elected section managers begin their new terms on October 1st. Jim Millsap, K9APD, will become the new ARRL Georgia section manager on Friday, October 1st. Millsap of Ackworth was the only candidate who applied by the June 4th nomination deadline. Millsap has been an ARRL emergency coordinator and district emergency coordinator. He's also served as ARRL Southeastern Division Vice Director from 2012 to 2014. Outgoing Section Manager David Benoist, AG4ZR of Sonoya, has decided not to run for a new term after serving since November of 2016. These incumbent Section Managers face no challengers in the summer election cycle and will also begin new two-year terms of office on October 1st. Robert Wareham, N0ESQ in Colorado. Diana Feinberg, AI6DF in Los Angeles. 
Carol Malazzo, KP4MD in Sacramento Valley, Bill Hallendahl, KH6GJV in San Francisco, Stuart Wolf, KF5NIX in South Texas, Monty Simpson, W7FF in Western Washington, and Dan Ringer, K8WV in West Virginia. Eastern Washington Section Manager Joe Whitney, KA7LJQ, was also the only nominee when the June 4th nomination deadline arrived. Whitney of Yakima was initially scheduled to start her elected term of office on October 1st. However, she was appointed to start her term of office on July 1st when outgoing section manager Jack Tiley, AD7FO, stepped down before the completion of his term. International Amateur Radio Union President Tim Elam, VE6SH, told his colleagues in a so-called fireside chat sponsored by Radio Amateurs of Canada that he, for one, was getting impatient to get back to in-person meetings. Elam attends a lot of meetings around the world, and much of the IARU's work over the past couple of years has been done in virtual sessions. The IARU itself hasn't met in person for over two years. Uh, we were hopeful that uh, we could do an in-person meeting in October. Uh, that unfortunately could not happen. Uh, some of our members could not travel. And the challenges in trying to do things hybrid, in a hybrid fashion, I think, are just, uh, are just too difficult. Elam said World Radio Communication Conference 2023 is not that far away and not being able to meet in person could be an issue. The fireside chat session on September 23rd, which was the keynote of Radio Amateurs of Canada's annual meeting, also included Radio Amateurs of Canada President Glenn McDonald, VE3XRA, RSGB President Steve Thomas, M1ACB, and ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Norwegian Communications Authority, ENCOM, has announced that radio amateurs will have to continue doing paper exams for a while longer, and the number of questions in the exam is going to be increased to 60. Norway has only one class of license, and it permits one kilowatt output. Their Herrick exam used to be the shortest amongst CEPT member countries, at just 28 questions. A few years ago, this was increased to 35, and now ENCOM has announced that the exam will consist of 60 questions. ENCOM said that, since they were unfortunately lagging behind in putting into place a digital trial scheme, they will have to continue with the paper exam a little longer than they'd hoped for, probably until the autumn of 2022. Despite the delayed introduction of the digital testing scheme, ENCOM wanted the radio amateur exam to consist of 60 questions, and it will do so from January 2022. A spokesperson said that ENCOM continues to work on questions for the new test sets and the expansion of the question database. Amateur radio groups that have plans to hold a licensed course in the spring of 2022 in Norway have been asked to note this. AMSAT North America past president and ham radio satellite and digital pioneer Tom Clark, K3IO, of Columbia, Maryland, died on September 28th after a short illness and hospital stay. An AWRL Life member, he was 82. Clark's accomplishments are legendary, and he left a lasting footprint in the worlds of amateur radio satellites and digital techniques. His longtime technical achievements, mentoring to others, and technical leadership will be missed by his many peers and friends the world over, said Bob McGuire, N4HY. To honor Clark, AMSAT has rebranded its upcoming annual gathering as the 2021 AMSAT Dr. Tom Clark K3IO Memorial Space Symposium and Annual General Meeting. It will take place on October 30th via Zoom. AMSAT members may register to attend via AMSAT's membership and event portal. The event will be live streamed on AMSAT's YouTube channel. A founding member of Tucson Amateur Packet Radio, Clark was co-founder of the Tapper AMSAT DSP project, which led to software-defined radio. He was a leader in the development of the AX.25 radio protocol. Clark served as AMSAT's second president from 1980 until 1987. He also served on the AMSAT and Tapper boards. In concert with McGuire, Clark developed the first amateur digital signal processing hardware, including a number of modems. 
He developed the uplink receivers and the spacecraft local area network architecture used on all the microsats, like AMSAT Oscar 16, Dove Oscar 17, WeberSat Oscar 18, Lusat Oscar 19, Italy Oscar 26, AMRAD Oscar 27, and TMSAT Oscar 31. McGuire said it was Clark who convinced him in 1985 that the future lay in DSP. We started the Tapper AMSAT Digital Signal Processing Project, and it was announced in 1987, McGuire recounted. We showed in our efforts that small stations with small antennas could bounce signals off the moon, and using the power of DSP, we could see the signals in our computer displays. This led to the software-defined transponder for satellite work, including Arisat and AMSAT Phase 3E. Clark received a doctorate in astrophysics from the University of Colorado. He went on to serve as chief of the astronomy branch at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center and was a senior scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, where he was a principal investigator for the space very long baseline interferometer activity going on there. In 2005, Clark became the first non-Russian to be awarded a gold medal of the Russian Academy of Sciences for his contributions to the international VLBI network. He is a member of the 2001 class of CQ Magazine's Amateur Radio Hall of Fame. In 2016, the ARRL awarded Clark with the President's Award to recognize his 60 years of advancing amateur radio technology. On that occasion, McGuire said there would be no AMSAT to inspire all of this work without Tom Clark. Tom saved the organization and inspired all of us to look to the future and aim for the stars. Clark was a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and the International Association of Geodesy. Amateur radio on the International Space Station will offer a group of pupils at the Mary Hare School for Deaf Children in England an opportunity to speak with an astronaut via amateur radio. The contact is expected to take place sometime during October 10th to the 17th. With more information on this upcoming event, we go to League Headquarters where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. The event will mark the first time an ARIS contact has been arranged with the School for Deaf Youngsters. The ARIS UK team is handling technical aspects of the contact, while the Newbury and District Amateur Radio Society will provide the amateur radio experience for the students through various events and activities at the school. In September, the school invited students to submit questions. The school staff will pick the top 10, and those students will get to ask their questions. The astronaut's response will then be rendered as text for the students. Starting on October 1st, the Amateur Radio on the International Space Station program will accept applications from U.S. schools, museums, science centers, and other youth organizations interested in hosting amateur radio contacts with ISS crew members. Contacts would be scheduled between July 1st and December 31st of 2022. The deadline to submit is November 24th. Go to www.aris.com hyphen USA dot org for details and a proposal form. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Mary Hare School, with Pippa Middleton as its ambassador, is the largest non-maintained school for deaf children in the United Kingdom. The event will mark the first time an heiress contact has been arranged with a school for deaf youth. It is a very exciting event, a world first for deaf pupils, said Alex Ayling, a science teacher at the school. I think it is very important to our deaf pupils, as it shows whatever your challenges with communication, there is no limit to what you can achieve. The sky is not the limit. Lessons related to ARIS include a crystal radio, electricity and circuits, forces, energy, sound, electromagnetism, space and space exploration, the ISS, and rocketry. At the school, an expected audience of 250 spaced-apart spectators will be able to see the radio contact firsthand. The remaining students and audience members will be linked in via web feed so that they do not miss out. Amateur radio equipment has been on board the International Space Station for more than 20 years, and most astronauts hold ham radio licenses. A live web feed will be available. Mary Hare School educates some 240 profoundly and severely deaf children, aged 5 to 19, each year. The inaugural Autumn New England Parks on the Air event will take place on Saturday, October 16th from 0000 to 2359 UTC, the K1USN Radio Club has announced. 
The goal is to have one group or individual operator at as many parks on the air as possible. The K1USN Radio Club hopes this will become an annual event. This is a recreational radio event, not a contest, so no logs will be required to participate. Summaries of activity are encouraged, however, and a post-event link will be available. This began as a reaction to the widespread local interest in the Parks on the Air program here in New England. Last year, Ohio had a successful Ohio-wide Parks on the Air weekend, and Wisconsin is now doing something similar, said K1USN Radio Club President Pi Pew, K1RV. Autumn is a special time in New England, and I figured the event might generate some extra interest before winter. Perhaps this can become an annual New England event, or better yet, an annual nationwide or worldwide event. ARRL New England Division Vice Director Phil Temples, K9HI, is hoping the event will give the public a chance to learn a bit more about amateur radio. He encouraged those who plan to participate to promote the event with informational handouts. Jamboree on the Air, the largest scouting event in the world, also occurs during the weekend of October 16th and 17th, and New England Parks on the Air participants are being encouraged to reach out to local scouting groups. A spreadsheet has been created to keep track of individuals and clubs that register. Contact K1RV for more information. At a meeting on September the 28th, the Board of Iceland's National Amateur Radio Society, the IRA, agreed to postpone the advertised online amateur radio course, which was to have started on October the 4th. The online course had been expected to run up until the exam date of December the 11th. The reason the IRA have given for the postponement is low levels of participation, with only three people having signed up and paid the course fee. They will now be reimbursed. The next course will be made available from February to May 2022. Consideration will be given to offering simultaneous on-site courses at Reykjavik University and distance courses over the internet. If more recently there is interest in taking an exam for an amateur radio license without the course, the IRA will take up the matter with the regulator, with a view to holding an exam on December the 11th. You can find out more at tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Iceland. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Uh, welcome. Good to see you. Let's see what happened this week. Captain Kirk is actually going where no man has gone before. Well, not exactly no man. Richard Branson, or Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson went there before. William Shatner, 90 years old, will be the oldest man ever to go into space. He's Remember the new Shepard capsule that Jeff Bezos with a cowboy hat rode up into kind of low Earth? It wasn't even orbit. Low, low, just barely sp up and down. That was it, into space. Shatner is slated to be part of the second crew on the new Shepard capsule. <laughs> TMZ say, you know, it'd be cool if he wears his Captain Kirk costume. <laughs> to boldly go where no 90-year-old has gone before. 66 and a half miles up, floating around a few minutes in zero gravity, and then uh, back to Earth. They're going to, uh, how does, it's expensive. Last time they sold it $20 million. But uh, I don't think it's going to cost that much to put Captain Kirk up there. It's pretty cool. And I think they're making a... Uh, a documentary about it. So they'll, <laughs> they'll make some money on it. To boldly go into space ish with Captain Kirk. Just read a um, piece in the Columbia Re Journalism Review saying that uh, we tech journalists should talk more about solutions. <laughs> We're kind of in the third stage of tech journalism. For the first few decades, it was rah rah journal. It was cheerleaders, right? It was like tech. It's great. It's changing the world. Look at this great shiny new gadget. This wonderful new thing. Uh, but um, of late, uh, recently, uh, we've been a little bit more open to the notion uh, that well, technology isn't all good. In fact, there's I think there's a little bit of a backlash. Uh, especially for those of us, and I'll include myself here, who were really bullish uh, uh, about what technology was going to do to 
make our world better. And, you know, I thought the Internet was going to break down barriers, was going to, you know, make such a difference in uh, how we communicate. It was it was going to eliminate the problem of, of nationalism. <laughs> no, <laughs> it was going to uh, make commerce friction free and that would be good for consumers. Yeah, that happened. Maybe, um, maybe not, not maybe for the best. Just read a long article in the New Yorker by uh, Charles Duhigg about Amazon and how it's basically eating the world. <laughs> it is too, isn't it? So the Columbia Journalism Review said, well, uh, we've gone from cheerleading now to, oh, technology's got to be broken up. Big tech is spying on us. We're living in something called surveillance capitalism. And, uh, that's an improvement, I guess, but maybe we should also look at solutions instead of just moaning and groaning. I agree with that, too. I agree with that, too. I think it's important that we, uh, we talk about how technology can improve itself. It's, it seems to be there's some, there's some, you know, how ideas get in the air and then everybody's writing about it. Because I also read a, uh, I think it was in the New York Times, a uh, opinion piece about not giving up on technology, how you know, it, you you don't have to assume that just because I guess a lot of us are kind of fatalistic about technology. Like, well, there's nothing you can do about it. So it's going to happen. It's rolling. So we might as well just, you know, live with it and try to figure out how to handle it the best. That's true, too. There is something we could do about it. We can have opinions. We should think about what we let the big companies like Facebook and Google do with our information and and we can make rules about how we want them to handle it to give us more power it's happening it's happened in europe with their general data protection regulation gdpr thank goodness a lot of the companies that we work with in the u.s also work in europe so a lot of those rest restrictions and protections have been extended to americans that's good there's some bad things about that You've seen the button. You can't miss it on almost every website now. Oh, we, we use cookies and just so you know and click OK. What a waste of space that is. <laughs> it's it's sometimes regulation can go too far. In California, uh, some years ago, we have a very, how shall I put it, robust referendum process where the people of California get to vote on things. And there was a proposition called Prop 65 that... Bay, I mean, it's on the surface of it. This was 1986, by the way. The Safe Drinking Water and Toxic Enforcement Act of 1986. Who would vote against that? 163% uh, to 37%. So everybody liked it. One of the provisions of Prop 65 in California, though, was you had to have warning about hazardous chemicals wherever they might be present. It turns out they're everywhere. So what do we have? Signs everywhere. Proc 65, note it, warning. Notice there, the, this area, uh, you may, this product contains chemicals or this area contains chemicals known to the state of California to cause cancer and birth defects and other reproductive harm. You see this everywhere you go. And on every product you buy, Disneyland, warning. The Disneyland Resort contains chemicals known to the state. I'm looking at a sign at Disneyland. Known to California to raise, cause cancer and birth defects. <laughs> well, <laughs> what are you going to do? By the way, it's a very pretty sign. It's got a little Disney-style <laughs> text. And <laughs> what are you going to do about that? Okay. I guess you can't go outside. But wait a minute. Your house is filled with the same chemicals. I, you know. So what happens is, since 1986, we've seen those signs everywhere. They've lost all meaning. Same thing with the cookie warning. Meaningless. It's just a waste of space on a web page. What do you do? You see it, right? You click OK, fine, accept, move on. Well, so sometimes well-meaning laws, they sound good. Who's who's in favor of toxic chemicals in the air? Nobody. They sound good, but sometimes they can have <laughs> unintended consequence. <sighs> it could be worse. Washington Post article t uh, today, I think it was. There's an, a... a uh, application that almost everybody in China over a well that, that's not true because there's what more than a billion people in China a hundred million downloads of this app it's on iOS and Android it's essentially required if you're a member of the Communist Party in China uh, many businesses require it it's it's a um, an app 
well, it's 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 translation in English is study the great nation. It's an educational app, and uh, there's quizzes. Some some places of work in China not only require you to have the app, but do the studying, take the quiz, get the points, or you you could get fired. So you're pretty much required. But wow, get this. So imagine, I mean, imagine there was an app that uh, everybody had to download. A uh, German cybersecurity firm, Cure53, took apart the app uh, at the request of uh, the Open Tech Fund. They investigated it. And the app basically gives the Chinese government super user access to the phone. They can turn on the microphone. They can see your location. They can download your text messages. They can download any files on your phone. They can take photos. They can dial phone numbers. They can go through your contacts and internet activity. They can retrieve information from 960 other applications, including shopping, travel, and messaging platforms. It can connect to your Wi-Fi. It can turn on the flashlight. This is virtually required by the Chinese government on people's phones. And we're worried about Google knowing, <laughs> knowing what you bought online or Amazon keeping track of what you bought. Can you imagine? <sighs> so I guess we should remember that we're in charge, at least so far in the United States. We can control this. And yeah, you know, maybe we should limit the kinds of things apps can do. Because they that the problem is this phone that you carry around in your pocket, if you carry a relatively modern smartphone, is a encyclopedia of information about you and everything you do and everything you think and everything you talk about with other people. And man, the feds would love access to that, wouldn't they? We should, you know, eternal vigilance is the price of freedom, right? We love our smartphones, right? I mean, it's an amazing thing. It's a, a, I mean, if you told me about this 20 years ago, I said, wow, the future. An always on internet device works anywhere. As you wander around, you're always connected to the internet. So there's no question you can't get an answer to. You can always see where you are on a map. Just that by itself. You can always see where you are on a map. You can't get lost anymore. That's amazing. <laughs> mind blown it has a camera and in fact modern most modern phones these days we're going to see the new google phone in on tuesday uh, it should have an amazing camera the new iphone absolutely i mean camera as good as any point and shoot better really because of all the computational capability it is a supercomputer in your pocket it has more power than one of those big cray supercomputers of 10 years ago i mean i can go on and on it's got an amazing display brilliant bright color display you can see pictures of your kids anytime. Much better than the old wallet photo. You always know exactly what time it is. I mean, I can go on and on. But this wonderful toy in our pocket, eh, it's really more than a toy. You practically can't live without it these days, is also a little bit of an enemy in our pocket. And that's the thing that's getting a little weird. I talked last hour about how the China is putting a strongly encouraging, in a way the only the Chinese government can, uh, Chinese citizens to put a, a educational app on their phone that in, in, in effect spies on them, completely spies on them. You know, it gives, gives the authorities every bit of information that's on the phone or that the phone can find out, including the microphone, the camera, the GPS, everything. And sure, if you're a totalitarian government, what a great way to control the populace. I mean... This is 1984. Remember the telescreens in 1984 that were watching you while you watched them? This is so much better because you're carrying it around with you in your pocket. So it's starting to be that this friendly little pocket pal has also become a little bit of the enemy. We're worried about Facebook and other companies using it to spy on us. This is not for your benefit. Oh, yeah, they paint it that way. Well, don't you always want to know what the weather's like? <laughs> if you're going to need an umbrella... Don't you want to know every financial traction, transaction? And maybe you do. But there's, I guarantee you, on any phone, many, many notifications for things you couldn't care less about. It's a public safety thing, too, right? When we had the power outages and the wildfires, there's a service. Uh, I think it's available in most of the country called Nixel. Do you have that on your phone? I, after the fires two years ago, of course, I've got it on my phone. And that's the way the law, law enforcement, sheriff's office, police, fire department, emergency services can get to you. can say, hey, watch out. But they got to be careful because they can overdo it and they can make you want to turn it off because, you know, they can't tell me everything that's going on. <laughs> Pretty soon your life is filled with jangly pop-ups from all sorts of places. 
It's really, I think, a good piece of advice when you get a new phone to go through and turn off notifications for stuff you don't care about. And I have to give Apple some credit because they have made it a little bit easier. If you have iOS 13 or maybe even 12, but certainly in the newest versions of iOS, if, you, if you're looking at a notification, you say, I don't want to hear from that program ever again. You could just put your finger on it, slide it. you got to slide it almost all the way to the edge, and you'll see a couple of things pop up. Clear all, view, and hidden deep within, so that you'll probably never notice it, is a button that says Manage. And when you get to that Manage, you can pop up a window that says Turn Off All Notifications. Don't bug me, baby. That's what they should say. They should say, Don't bug me ever again. The phones that I use when I'm doing the radio show Go in the settings, the, the little gear icon, and both both Android and iOS have this, a do not disturb feature. It silences calls and notifications. Nothing will annoy you. Now, I have it, normally we have it set, you know, when we go to bed and when we get up so it doesn't bother you at night. But on the phones I have in studio with me, I almost always set it for the show times as well because I don't want to be bugged. I don't want the phone to ring during the shows or pop up things or whatever. Go into settings. Tap that do not disturb and, and turn it on. After a while, I thought about it. I said, I don't. I guess I don't really need to be disturbed ever. <laughs> Depends on how curmudgeonly you want to be. But you could turn that on from 11.59 a.m. till noon p.m. No, no. Let's see. What would you do? You'd turn it on from 12.01 p.m. to 12 p.m. So there'd be one minute... <laughs> In the in, in at noon when all the notifications could come in, you can't turn it off. You can't say forever. You have to have allow. I think you have to allow at least one minute. <laughs> but really, this is this is the, an interesting problem that the phone is both our little plastic pal that's fun to be with, and the enemy in our pocket. But the good news is, I think you can tame it, unless you're a citizen of the Chinese. Government's uh, got a app on your phone. There's not much you can do at that point. You just kind of got to go along to get along. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. On September 11th, some 115 amateur radio volunteers from five states provided communication support for Lo Toja, the longest single-day USA cycling-sanctioned bicycle event in the country, and now in its 39th year. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, is here with more in this report from ARR headquarters in Newington. Starting in Logan, Utah, the 203-mile course ends in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. That's the JA part. Taking cyclists through northeastern Utah, southeastern Idaho, and western Wyoming in the process. Some 1,700 cyclists participated this year. The event benefits the Huntsman Cancer Foundation. The Ham Radio Group provides neutral wheel support, which substitutes wheels and equipment in the event of failures as well as first aid as needed and provides communication from start to finish. The race deploys four command centers and multiple repeaters. Some 150 hams provide uninterrupted communication throughout the race route. Kevin Reeve, N7RXE, the coordinator of amateur radio operators and communication systems for the race, explained that two portable repeaters are installed on mountaintops and the team deploys multiple APRS repeaters. Tyler Griffiths, N7UWX, called the race the Amateur Radio Emergency Service Radio Operator's Dream Event. We know where it starts, where it ends, and everything that happens in between is different from one year to the next. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The race attracts thousands of applicants, and upward of 2,000 are selected to compete. Hams participate from multiple clubs in Utah, including the Goldman Spike Amateur Radio Club, the Ogden Amateur Radio Club, and the Utah Valley Amateur Radio Club. The race deploys four command centers and multiple repeaters. Prior to the event, race director Brent Chambers told the Cache Valley newspaper that this year's race will have 600 course volunteers. 
which includes 150 AM radio operators and helpers from the Bridgerland Amateur Radio Club. They provide uninterrupted communication throughout the Lotoja's mountainous and remote terrain. Ted MacArthur, AC7II, heads the communications infrastructure team. In all, nine repeaters and several simplex frequencies are used throughout the event, and APRS plays an important role. With an increase in the number of mobile vehicles needed to meet a growing event, net control stations were spending a lot of radio time asking for position reports. We needed airtime for real traffic, helping cyclists at emergencies, and other critical traffic, MacArthur said. According to a report on WSIL Television, the new mobile command center of the Massac County Amateur Radio Club is making its debut at a major fall celebration in Illinois this month. But the vehicle's appearance there is actually a dress rehearsal for the real role, assisting in emergencies. The trailer, which is on loan to the club, will be introduced to the public at the annual Fort Massac encampment on the 16th and 17th of October. Club President Ruben Fuentes, WB5WTF, said the club has been busy outfitting it with radios, cables, and antennas, and will demonstrate its operation during the two-day event. He went on to say that our goal is to be completely prepared to utilize the trailer in response to natural or man-made disasters, such as floods, earthquakes, and tornadoes. The fall celebration is part of their preparatory work for activities requiring more urgent response. This will afford us the opportunity to fine-tune our equipment as well as our skill, Ruben said. Club members will also be working to purchase the loan trailer to make it a permanent part of their resources. WN2MAM WB2MAM N2CLO KE2XB AB2CA W2XOY Okay, as you can probably guess, with all the attention on the vanity call sign system, not to mention the half dozen calls that I've held since 1969, this edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives is going to focus on call signs in amateur radio history. Prior to 1912, getting a call sign was easy. Just make one up and get on the air. Legend has it, that's how the word ham came to mean amateur radio. The letters H-A-M were allegedly the initials of the three operators of a powerful station in the early teens. With the passage of the Radio Act of 1912, the first licenses were issued. Call signs at that time for private stations, i.e. amateurs, consisted of a number followed by two or later three letters. For example, 1AW, 1TS, 8XK, etc. Other countries adopted the system. This was adequate in the early days of Spark and amateur radio, but as the shortwaves were developed and CW became universal, problems appeared. Dave Sumner, Executive Vice President of the ARRL and Trustee of NU1AW, the station of the International Amateur Radio Union, states, When transoceanic amateur communications started becoming commonplace in 1924, a problem immediately became apparent. Call signs were all of the one numeral followed by two or three letters format, with no built-in means of determining who was where. At first, an informal system of prefixes, called intermediates at the time, was used by amateurs, where the letter A stood for Australia, B for Belgium, C for Canada, F for France, G for Great Britain, J for Japan, U for the United States, Z for New Zealand, etc. The single letter system was fine until it became apparent that amateur radio was spreading to too many countries for this system to accommodate. In the January 1927 QST, a new intermediate list was unveiled as the work of the Executive Committee of the International Amateur Radio Union. The new list took effect on February 1, 1927. It was a two-letter system with the first letter indicating the continent, E for Europe, A for Asia, N for North America, F for Africa, etc., and the second letter indicating the country mostly following the old system. Thus, stations in the 48 United States used the intermediate NU. The new system was quickly overtaken by events. 
The regulations adopted by the Washington International Radio Telegraph Conference later the same year included the allocation of a series of call signals such as K, N, and W for the United States and mandated that stations have a call signal from the series. The Washington regulations were to become effective on January 1, 1929, but in August 1928, QST noted that the Canadian amateur call signs had changed to VE in April, and in September 1928, QST announced the effective date of October 1, 1928 in the United States for the W prefix and K outside the 48 states. Thus, amateurs sported voluntary NU prefixes for just 20 months before they became Ws. The founding president of the International Amateur Radio Union was, of course, Hiram Percy Maxim, 1AW, who remained in that office until his death in 1936. The call sign NU1AW commemorates Hiram Percy Maxim and the International Amateur Radio Union's creative, if short-lived, solution to the problem of international identification of stations. As trustee of NU1AW, Dave Sumner states that it is his intention to use the call sign as a permanent special event station operating in connection with World Telecommunication Day, significant IARU activities, the IARU HF World Championship, and other events that will call attention to the contributions of the IARU to organized amateur radio. My thanks to K1ZZ for allowing me to use the above. Thus, the call sign structure was set up for the rest of the 1920s and the 1930s. Stations in the 48 states had a 1x2 or 1x3 call sign beginning with W and containing a numeral from 1 to 9. Stations in Alaska, Hawaii, or other U.S. possessions had a K prefix. Incidentally, note that I said 1 through 9. This is because the numeral zero was not available to amateurs at that time. As a result, the call sign districts had different boundaries than they do today. For example, the western sections of New York and Pennsylvania were in the eighth call district then, as opposed to the second and third today. Southern portions of New Jersey were in part of the third call district rather than the second. When amateur radio resumed after World War II, the increased number of amateurs necessitated the addition of the 10th call district and the numeral zero. Except for the redrawing of the boundaries, things remained the same until 1951-1953 era. In 1951, the FCC eliminated the old Class A, Class B, and Class C licenses and replaced them with the Novice, Technician, Conditional, General, and Extra Class. What happened to the advanced class? The ancient amateur archives will tell you in a future edition. With this change came the first distinctive call signs. Novices, who at that time could only get a one-year non-renewable license, had a special 2 by 3 call sign with the letter N following the W. For example, WN2ODC, WN6ISQ, WN2MAM, etc. When they upgraded, the N would be dropped. This system barely had a chance to settle in before the next change hit in 1953. Due to the increase in the number of amateurs, the FCC was running out of W 1x3 call signs. So 1x3K calls began to appear in the 48 states, with the U.S. possessions receiving 2x2 and 2x3K calls, such as those issued today. Novices in the 48 states continued to have the distinctive N call, such as KN4LIB, with the N disappearing upon upgrading. Barely five years later, the growth of amateur radio, particularly in the second and the sixth call districts, caused another problem for the FCC. They were running out of K and W calls. So in 1958, the FCC began issuing 2 by 3 WA calls to be followed by WB when necessary. For some reason, novices under this new system were given WV as in Victor, instead of WN as their prefix. The V would change to an A or a B upon upgrading. After only a few years of this, the FCC decided that their original idea was better, chucked the Vs, and went back to the novice N prefix. With the uneven amateur population in the 10 call districts, it took time for the K calls to run out in the other areas. As late as 1964, you could still get a K call in the first, 
third or seventh call areas, while the second and the sixth districts were well into the WBs. The 1960s had some other call sign oddities. For a period of time, you could hold both a novice and technician class license simultaneously. The FCC gave you two call signs at once, such as WA2ORS, WN2ORS, and you used the appropriate call based on the amateur band and your privileges on it. The FCC also allowed you to have two calls if you maintained two homes and separate call areas. For example, Senator Barry Goldwater, K7UGA, also held K3UIG, which he used when he was in Washington. In theory, under this system, an amateur could hold four call signs if he or she had a novice and technician license and two separate addresses. Except for the novice and the distinctive N, there was no way under this system to tell what class of license an amateur held. As older hams became silent keys and the number of available one by two calls slowly increased, the FCC instituted a program whereby those who held an extra class license for more than 25 years would be eligible for a one by two. The length of time one needed to be an extra was gradually reduced until July 1977 when any extra class could apply for a 1x2. There was one block of call signs that were unavailable to any amateur regardless of license class. These were calls in which the suffix began with X, such as W1XW, W3XCV, WB6XXK, etc. The FCC reserved these calls for experimental stations. For example, W2XBS, W2XOY, W1XMN, and KE2XCC were originally call signs of early TV and FM broadcast stations. While the FCC has relaxed their position on the 1x2 and 1x3X suffix calls, the 2x3 call signs, such as KA6XYZ, are still reserved for experimental use. By the mid-1970s, the 2nd, 4th, 6th, and 8th call areas had run out of WBs. For a period of time, the FCC recycled older WA and WB calls that had been vacated, but when those ran out, they went to WDs. Now, WCs were reserved for and being issued to races and civil defense stations. Before the WD prefix could become popular, however, an incident occurred that would change the whole call sign structure. In early 1977, an FCC employee was indicted for taking bribes offered by amateurs wanting special call signs. He was convicted and sent to jail. Partially as a result of this scandal, the FCC on February 23, 1978, adopted the call sign structure we have in place today. For 18 years, from 1978 until 1996, when the vanity call system opened, it had been impossible to request a specific individual or club call. Given the passionate love affair that some of us have with our calls, the FCC has made millions. So, as you contemplate the call of your dreams, take a moment to tune in NU1AW and work a piece of history. Meanwhile, the ancient amateur archives is preparing for its next journey to another moment in amateur radio history. I hope you're on board. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. One of the resources Hapali KC9RP drew upon in his early years of producing audio ham radio programming was Bill Pasternak, WA6ITF, co-founder and driving force behind Westlink Radio. One of Bill's interviews Hap most cherished was a short 1989 interview with former Senator Barry Goldwater, K7UGA, conducted by national science reporter Roy Neal, K6DUE. This is Roy Neal, K6DUE in Scottsdale, Arizona, at the home of Barry Goldwater, high atop a windy hill, a place of great natural beauty, and it's a dream location for ham radio, a lifelong passion of the former senator and Air Force general. K7UGA is his call, and in the world of ham radio, we call him Barry. If we don't go no-code, do you think we can hold on to our present frequencies? Can they hold on to it with the numbers we have? My answer would be very doubtful. Can you hold on to it with a couple hundred thousand young amateurs? Yes, because they all vote. They can all communicate with the Congress. They can tell them, look, we don't want you taking these frequencies away from us. 
And I'll tell you, as former chairman of the communications subcommittee, I practically never heard from a ham. Barry, what influence, if any, do you think the amateur fraternity can have on politicians? You'll find among the 535 members of our Congress right now, not one amateur operator. Now, there are some that are interested because they have friends and constituents that are interested in saving a frequency. And they've had a lot of mail on it, but they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Barry, what is your position on no code? I hate to say this to you, because I'm one of those sort of old-fashioned hams that really love the code. But we are not getting new amateurs. So we do away with the code requirement. And we bring a lot of new young men into the business of amateurs and also into the business of bettering the new communication systems. You're proposing a, a no-code license? I frankly would put more emphasis on the, the technical questions. Forget about the code. Nobody's going to use it. Now, there used to be a pretty good argument for learning code. Can we say, well, it'll come in handy if you ever become a member of the armed service, no more. There's no requirement for it. All the forces have dropped it. As I say, everything new is digital, computerized, and there's, there's darn few things you can't do with a computer and equipment. How would you propose that we get into the business of no code? Well, the business is very rather simple. You first would have to get the ARRL, the American Radio Relay League, behind it. You'd have to get these magazine editors, who I think are inclining that way. you got to remember one thing. You have more amateurs, you're going to sell more equipment. But the easiest way is to convince the American Radio Relay League that opposition or no opposition, if they want to increase the amateur ranks, they have to do away with the number one objection, code. I know a lot of people will be shocked to hear an old-timer like me say that. We're not going to do away with code. I want to sit down here and wobble the key. I'll do that forever. But it isn't going to be with some young kid that wants to become an amateur. Let's put that in practice. How would it really work? Schools come up here. Young people come up here to watch radio communications, and they're all thrilled. But then you say, now you're going to have to learn Morse code. They think it's impossible. And you know, and I know, that it's not. But that's their attitude. And they don't want any part of Morse code. Even if God stuck a pen in their head and said, you can now work Morse, uh, they wouldn't want it. They, they're, enthr they're, they're enthralled by the new communications. Bordeaux, the uh, high-speed digital frequencies, the all the different things that we have today. I'd hate like the devil to start over again and have to learn. No, I'd rather learn the Morse code over again. So uh, we'll make more advancement with young people fiddling around with their soldering irons and a good book and a box full of junk than by teaching a Morse code when nobody much talks in Morse code anymore. Would it be fair to say the day of the Morse operator is gone? Well, I'll make a prophecy, and I won't be alive to ever see it come true. If we continue to require a knowledge of code for a license, people are going to just plain die. Uh, I'm 80. I'm not going to be around here forever. But when I'm gone, that's one less guy that knows the code. So what the hell is the difference? I don't want to see amateur radio die out because, as I've said, all of the well, 98 percent of all the improvements made in radio have come out of an amateur shack. I want to see that encouraged. As I say, I think we can swell our ranks by at least 200,000 if we just allow young amateurs or would-be amateurs to come in as a licensed amateur 
without having gone through the, I don't call it painful, but through the process of learning Morse code. We've been talking to K7 UGA, Barry Goldwater, uh, one of the true pioneers of amateur radio. His contribution to the service is legendary. Now, today in the 1980s, Barry Goldwater believes deeply that the time has come to eliminate one of the main staples of amateur radio licensing procedure, Morse code. He pleads the case with fellow hams that new blood, young hams, are needed to carry on the tradition and to carry the service into the future. And Senator Goldwater, K7 UGA, says unequivocally that the time has come for the amateur fraternity to debate the issues of no code and then take action as they deem fit. And now for Barry Goldwater, K7 UGA, this is Roy Neal, K6 DUE in Scottsdale, Arizona, 73. A number of the voices that became familiar to our Rain Report listeners in the 90s were introduced to our listenership of the Bear Information Service, BIS, in suburban Chicago in the late 80s. One of those familiar voices was Blair Alper, KA9SEQ, an Iowa ham whose ham roots were as the trustee for the so-called Lidfar 220 repeater in the Chicago suburb of Oak Park before he relocated to Iowa in the 90s. This editorial is the result of an event that happened this summer. We were driving down an isolated section of Pennsylvania Route 6 on our way back to our cottage when we witnessed an accident. We were quite close to becoming the third car in the pileup, in fact. There were no other cars on the road and nothing around. I got out and while my mother checked the injuries, I pulled out my trusty HT. It was already tuned to the local repeater which is on top of West Mountain at 2200 feet. Yes, you heard me right. This little 18-watt repeater has 50-mile handheld coverage. I got on the repeater and announced that I was at the scene of a multi-car accident with injuries and a fire. Nothing. I knew that the machine had an open auto patch, so I called the police directly. By the way, contrary to popular belief, an open auto patch is one whose bring up code is asterisk and kill is pound sign, and the repeater users will be happy to tell you so, even on the air. After the call, I had trouble dumping the patch. The repeater uses a 567 tone decoder, and it was a hot day up on the mountain. Someone showed up and dumped it for me without even bothering to ID. I said, thanks, whoever you are, and put the radio away. This whole thing got me thinking, hey, these people don't think the way I do. I started asking some questions. These smaller town hams seem to look at us in the city for the most part the way we look at the hams in California and laugh. They are suspicious and say things like, look what they have done now. When I mentioned novice enhancement, I was jumped all over and told, we don't understand that one. Exactly what were you people trying to do, implying that it was a plot we had cooked up for them. All we have noticed is that it has brought a bunch of lids to the local 220 machine who know nothing about repeaters. What did you do about it, I asked. The reply was, we took the machine off the air. I thought they were kidding. So I pulled out my 220 HT and sure enough, the machine was gone. I was also in New York and Washington DC this summer and in both cases found novice classes and novice oriented repeaters and crosslinks. The cities, at least the ones I visited, seem to have accepted the responsibility to teach new operators. I found more or less the same things I find in Chicago, only the names of the organizations were changed. While I heard some talk of crosslinks on the Pennsylvania machine, it was more of an ego box type of discussion. They didn't seem to be in touch with what was really going on, so I dug deeper. Where can I hear this week's Westlink, I asked. The answer was, what's that? Well, after that, it came as no surprise to me that none of them had ever heard of the Bear Information Service, even though it's available on 10 and 40 meters, and I know they all have low band rigs. Then I got on 220. It took some scanning, but I finally found the secret simplex channel where the locals were hiding from novices. Hey, any of you guys got get 220 notes? No? Why not? Aren't you interested in what novice Hansen is really all about? What about 8714, I asked. No one batted an eye. Either they didn't know what I was talking about or didn't care. I was afraid to ask which. I would assume that they buy the ham magazines, but I could not honestly say that I believe they read them. 
for the most part, everyone seems to know everything they needed to know about ham radio. I think what hit me the most is that everyone seems to know something different. It wouldn't be so bad if they got together and attempted to iron it all out, but as most of them are low benders, their signals go right over the heads of their local friends and neighbors, ending up in California. Ever notice how all low band signals end up in California? Can you talk to a guy across town on 40 meters? I'm not even sure. At this point, I should say that I have nothing against small towns with one or two major repeaters where all the guys know each other. The same thing can be found in downstate Illinois, by the way. My intention is in presenting this is to show another popular view, one which we in the big city don't get to see very often. When a big issue comes up, we tend to deal with it quickly or at least grumble about it right away. If things are going to get better in ham radio, I suggest that it is these people you have to influence. For the record, I am for a novice enhancement, but I don't think that making the license better is the answer. Have you noticed that you don't have a very hard time getting interested friends involved with the hobby once they understand what it's all about? Let's face it, if everyone knew about ham radio, they wouldn't stop you on the street with your HT and ask either, are you a cop or is that a CB? Have you ever been asked anything else? Those are the two I hear most often. I always ask, have you ever heard of amateur radio? And when they say no, and they almost always do, I say, well, have you heard of shortwave and a guy wearing headphones talking around the world by voice or using a key to send Morse code? They almost always say yes to that one. I say, well, this is the 80s version. Then I tell them it's easy to get involved if they are interested. Remember Elmering? That's how I got my license, and I still maintain it's about the most exciting way to get into this hobby. I only wish I'd done it sooner. If we are going to survive, we don't need tons of new hams. What we need is some 80s PR to go with our 80s HTs. This has been a guest editorial by Blair, K and on SEQ, for the Bear Information Service. An early guest commentary filed for Hapali KC9RP's Bear Information Service in 1989 by Blair Alper, KA9SEQ, a voice who would become familiar to listeners of the Rain Report in the 90s. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. The UK Royal Air Force Air Cadets are pleased to announce that they're proposing to run the next leg of their ever-popular Blue Ham radio communications exercise, number 21-2, in October 2021, using frequencies shared with radio amateurs in the UK 5 MHz band. The exercise will take place during the weekend of the 16th and 17th of October 2021, when organisers hope that you can put some time aside to join in with the cadets and staff on the exercise. Details of the exchange of information to count as a contact will be published on their website at alphacharlie.org.uk. That's alphacharlie.org.uk. And that will be published sometime in early October. The organisers will issue a Blue Ham Participation Certificate if you contact 15 or more special Mike Romeo Echo call signs over the period of the exercise. Details of how to do this will also be on the alphacharlie.org.uk website. The event will be a military-style national HF radio exercise for the cadets. Following the easing of COVID-19 restrictions, many military format call signs will be operating, exchanging information with as many radio amateur stations as possible during the exercise. The organisers are inviting UK and European amateur radio operators to take part and make this the biggest combined cadet and amateur radio exercise they've been involved in to date. As mentioned, the exercise will take place on the UK Ministry of Defence 5 MHz shared band, that's 60 metres wavelength, and a significant part of the exercise will be in the section of the band where radio amateurs are also authorised to operate. Exercise Blue Ham is one of several events that the RAF Air Cadets will be holding to mark the 80th anniversary of the formation of the Air Training Corps in 1941. Check out the entry for GB80 Alpha Tango Charlie at QRZ.com. 
Space weather woman Tabitha Scove, WX6SWW, has some exciting news. We actually have about a 25% chance of M-class flares and a 5% chance of X-class flares. So amateur radio operators, well, you could be seeing some, uh, you know, radio blackouts on Earth's day side. But hey, you'll take it because solar flux is now boosted into the triple digits and we have good radio propagation on Earth's day side. And that's going to last easily over this week and possibly into the next week. The only issue you have to worry about is when that solar storm hits, radio propagation on Earth's night side could be a little dicey. Sun watcher Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, said on October 1st that sunspot activity was up during the last week of September, with the average daily sunspot number rising from 28.7 to 59.4, and average daily solar flux up 11.4 points over the week to 89.8. In Tad's words, nice to see our sun peppered with spots again as we move into the second week of fall in the Northern Hemisphere. An update on the progress of Solar Cycle 25 has been posted by Robert Marston, Alpha Alpha 6 X-Ray Echo. As September 2021 winds down, the solar flux readings are the second highest readings of the new solar cycle, topped only by the dramatic run-up last November. It's worth taking a good long last look at the September numbers, as the current ramp-up in solar activity will easily go beyond them in October. In the closing 36 hours of the month, the 10.7 cm solar flux measurement has jumped up 12 points to 101 and was rising fast as this report was being prepared. The 10.7 cm solar flux measurement is a determination of the strength of solar radio emission in a 100 MHz wide band centered on 2800 MHz, which is a wavelength of 10.7 cm, averaged over one hour. The monthly mean sunspot number for September will be about 54 in the new scale. The smoothed sunspot number for September is 46, and this means that September's sunspot numbers are easily the highest of the new solar cycle thus far. And the good news doesn't stop there. On September the 14th, Scott McIntosh from the National Centre for Atmospheric Research announced that he expects the termination event, concluding cycle 24, is imminent, and a rapid run-up in solar activity will commence in mid-November. The termination event is a new discovery and still controversial amongst space scientists. The suggestion is that bands of magnetic energy of opposite polarity move towards the Sun's equator from north and south, and when they collide, they obliterate each other and the outgoing solar cycle is finished. Solar minimum in the 11-year cycle was recorded in November 2019. The last numbered Solar Cycle 24 sunspot was observed in July 2020, and the last active region was observed on August the 14th this year, 2021. So it appears that Cycle 24 is over. CQ Worldwide Contest Director John Doerr, K1AR, recently discussed contesting with top-tier contester Tim Duffy, K3LR. Doerr said he hears a lot of good ideas, such as ways to get more young people into contesting, but you can't adopt all of them. The, the only challenge we have uh, is, of course, category inflation. You know, there, there are some good ideas on how to slice and dice and create little mini competitions within the competition, which I like. Uh, so it's, it's a balance between, you know, having too much of that and, and really capitalizing on what could be an opportunity. So we think about that all the time. Youth was the, was the favorite one this year. CQ Worldwide Contest Director John Doerr, K1AR, speaking recently with Tim Duffy, K3LR. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Foundations of Amateur Radio. When you begin your amateur radio journey, one of the first things you learn about that's not directly involved with radios and antennas is the ionosphere and its impact on long-distance communications. Immediately after that, you're more likely than not to be introduced to the biggest plasma experiment in our backyard, the Sun. With that introduction comes information about solar flares, solar flux, sunspots, geomagnetic storms, coronal mass ejections, as well as the solar cycle, the solar index, and associated propagation forecasts. Before I dig further, I will point out that I'm mentioning this with the ultimate aim for you to get on air and make noise. So fasten your seatbelt and let's go for a ride. The sun is big. 
If it was hollow, it could fit more than a million Earths inside. The Sun accounts for 99.8% of the total mass of our entire solar system. About 73% of the Sun's mass is hydrogen, about 25% is helium, and the rest, about 1.69%, is made up of all the other heavier elements, both gases and metals, which add up to around 5,628 times the mass of Earth. The Sun rotates, counterclockwise. Since it's mostly plasma, it doesn't rotate like Earth does. The equator takes about 24 days, the poles around 35 days. And because it's rotating on an angle of about 7.25 degrees from Earth's rotation axis, we get to see more of the solar north pole in September and more of the solar south pole in March. Earth orbits the Sun in a year, but it's not a circular orbit. We're closest to the Sun in December and furthest from the Sun in June. It takes about 8 minutes and 19 seconds for a photon leaving the Sun to reach Earth. But that same photon can take between 40,000 and 170,000 years to travel from the core, where two atoms were heated and compressed to fuse into a new element, releasing a photon and heat. It takes this long because the photon keeps bumping into other atoms along the way. While we're at it, consuming about 4 million tonnes of hydrogen per second, the Sun will take another 5 billion years to consume all the available hydrogen. Whilst we experience the Sun as a source of light on a daily basis, as a radio amateur you know that light is just one tiny part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It should come as no surprise that the Sun is radiating across all frequencies all the time, only some of which is visible to our naked eye. As an aside, it's interesting to note that our eyes are essentially translating light into electricity, or said differently, your eye converts radio spectrum into electricity, something which your radio antenna also does. Back to the Sun. I'm highlighting this level of solar complexity because there's so much talk around the A index, the K index, the SFI, the solar cycle and propagation by experts and amateurs, that it's easy to hide behind those numbers and think that a low A between 1 and 6, a low K of 0 or 1 with an SFI above 100, will give you the propagation you're looking for. If you think for a moment that the weather forecaster has a difficult job accurately telling you if you need to postpone your outdoor activation because of rain or snow, then you can begin to understand just how complex the interplay between the Sun and our ionosphere is. And I haven't even mentioned that the ionosphere isn't static either. It's important to remember that the cute little weather icons you see on the TV news are just as much an indicator of expected weather as the AK and SFI numbers are for the Sun and its impact on radio propagation. They give you an idea of what might happen, but it doesn't mean that on any given day something completely random and isolated happens that just affects your station and the path that a radio signal took from your antenna to that other rare DX station. Just like it would be smart to take an umbrella with you when there's rain forecast, it's also smart to consider the bands you want to operate next time you go on air with a particular solar forecast. But just because it might rain doesn't mean you're guaranteed to get wet. So, in other words, wait for it, get on air and make some noise. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The Northern Lights are nothing new, but citizen scientists' study of the aurora is a fairly recent development. It's been 10 years since that October night when space weather scientist Elizabeth McDonald logged into Twitter to read the observations people were recording about an aurora-filled northern sky, the product of a solar storm. That moment marked the starting point for Aurorasaurus, a means by which thousands of citizen scientists and aurora enthusiasts around the world contribute real-time observations about the northern lights. The research project has garnered support of the National Science Foundation and, according to its website, has participation from researchers at NASA, the New Mexico Consortium, Penn State University, and Science Education Solutions. Popular solar weather woman Dr. Tamitha Skov, WX6SWW, recently joined in the celebration by tweeting congratulations on the 10-year anniversary of Aurorasaurus and to all the dedicated Aurora field reporters and contributors over the years. If you're interested in participating, visit the website at aurorasaurus.org. 
If there's one instrument that hams and other radio enthusiasts covet, it's the venerable Bird 43 Throughline Watt Meter. This useful RF tool has barely changed in the nearly 70 years since it was first introduced, and they're built like a tank. This makes bird meters highly desirable, and therefore quite expensive, either brand new or on the swap meet circuit. The meter works across a wide frequency range, and on a large display needle can show you power going towards the antenna and how much is being reflected back if the antenna is poorly matched. But radio amateurs are nothing if not resourceful, and building a homemade version of the bird watt meter, as Brazilian ham Luciano Sturaro Papa Yankee 2 Bravo Bravo Sierra did, it's a good way to get your hands on one. Granted, Luciano had a head start. He had a spare line set, which is the important bit from the bird watt meter. The machined metal part is effectively an air-insulated section of coaxial cable that the radio frequency signal passes through on its way from transmitter to antenna. A so-called slug is inserted into the cavity in the line set to sense the RF and couple it to the meter electronics. The slug can be rotated 180 degrees to measure RF travelling in either direction, allowing the user to determine how much RF is getting reflected by the antenna system. The thing about bird and bird-like meters is that the slugs are like potato chips. You can't have just one. So normally, the bird would be supplied with a box of slugs covering different frequency ranges. You can read the full Hackaday article at hackaday.com. Time now for the AMSAT report. The AMSAT engineering team says AO92 was shut down after the integrated housekeeping unit, the IHU, had switched to safe mode, likely due to low voltage during eclipse. FalconSat 3 is down as well due to low voltage. The Japanese Komaki Amateur Satcom Club wants CW operators to listen for its new satellite, ZSAT, which was set to launch on October 1st. The frequency is 145.8. 875 megahertz send reports to jr2xea at nagoya.so hyphen net dot jp if you'd like to demonstrate how to receive a satellite signal and decode telemetry check out the amsat cubesat simulator at cubesatsim.com borrow or build. AMSAT has rebranded its upcoming annual gathering as the 2021 AMSAT Dr. Tom Clark K3IO Memorial Space Symposium, an annual general meeting. It takes place October 30th via Zoom. Clark died September 28th at the age of 82. The AMSAT report comes to us courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. According to NBC News, a California amateur radio club in a region imperiled by deadly wildfires has led the charge for a recently approved early warning system designed to enhance safety in communities near the San Bernardino National Forest. At the urging of the Mile High Radio Club, the Riverside County Board of Supervisors approved the network of strategically placed speakers to broadcast public safety information during wildfires and other emergencies and disasters. The speakers are to be located at schools, camps, fire stations, and other venues. The Mile High Club has been a proponent of the project, which will receive a $210,000 grant from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. The project is expected to be built in five phases and take about two years before it's fully operational. The HAMS have favored the establishment of the communication system to enhance their own roles in providing real-time information to first responders and the public during a crisis. The club is based in Idlewild and covers the San Jacinto Mountain region, which is a high-risk zone for wildfires, such as the Cranston Fire in 2018. To provide effective emergency communications, amateur radio operators need to find and eliminate sources of radio frequency interference that could hinder their operations. Unfortunately, RFI, as it's known, is a widespread problem in Southern California that affects not only amateur radio operators, but also businesses, governments and the military, and RFI complaints can go unresolved for years. To track down these sources of interference, Ares LAX, an arm of the ARRL Los Angeles section, has a core of technical volunteers. Without the proper equipment, however, the task is time-consuming and sometimes fruitless. To make the volunteer's job easier, Ares LAX recently purchased a Fluke II-910, an acoustic imager, with a $23,600 grant from Amateur Radio Digital Communications. 
Amateur Radio Digital Communications is a California-based foundation with roots in amateur radio and the technology of internet communication. The organization got its start by managing the Ampernet address space, which it designated to license amateur radio operators worldwide. Additionally, ARDC makes grants to projects and organizations that follow amateur radio's practice and tradition of technical experimentation in both amateur radio and digital communication science. Such experimentation has led to broad advances, such as the mobile phone and wireless internet technology. ARDC envisions a world where all such technology is available through open source hardware and software. The Fluke II910 Acoustic Imager uses ultrasonic techniques to pinpoint the source of the interference and produce photographic evidence, which is invaluable when submitting a repair request to a utility company. The capabilities of the II910 Acoustic Imager are particularly helpful in the radio-dense environment of Southern California, which has many potential noise sources. The goal of Ares LAX is to eliminate all radio frequency interference sources in Los Angeles County. This would pave the way for better communications in emergency situations and in the end, save lives. Ares LAX is a non-profit corporation that supports the work of the Los Angeles County Amateur Radio Emergency Service. Los Angeles County Ares provides backup communication for most of the receiving hospitals in the county and for the County Department of Health Services Medical Alert Center. To accomplish this mission, Los Angeles County Ares trains amateur radio operators in emergency communications and provides assistance in setting up and troubleshooting amateur radio stations with the objective of increasing the pool of operators ready to respond when emergency communications are needed. You can learn more about Los Angeles County Ares at www.ariesLAX.org. Starting on October 1st, Amateur Radio on the International Space Station will accept applications from U.S. schools, museums, science centers, and community youth organizations, either individually or working together, interested in hosting amateur radio contacts with crew members on the International Space Station. Contacts will be scheduled between July 1st and December 31st, 2022. Crew scheduling and ISS orbits will determine the exact contact dates. ARIS is looking for organizations that will draw a sizable number of participants and integrate the contact into a well-developed education plan. The deadline to submit is November 24th. Proposal information and more details, including expectations, proposal guidelines, and proposal forms, are on the ARIS US website. An ARIS introductory webinar session will be held on October 7th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 2400 UTC. Sign up for the webinar via Eventbrite. Each year, ARIS provides tens of thousands of students with opportunities to learn about space technologies and communications through amateur radio. Crew members aboard the ISS will participate in scheduled amateur radio contacts. These contacts are approximately 10 minutes long and allow students to interact with the astronaut through a question and answer session. The program offers learning opportunities by connecting students to orbiting astronauts through a partnership that includes the ARRL, AMSAT, and NASA, as well as other amateur radio organizations and space agencies in Russia, Canada, Japan, and Europe. The program's goal is to inspire students to pursue interests and careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, as well as amateur radio. Educators overwhelmingly report that student participation in the ARIS program stimulates interest in STEM subjects and in STEM careers, ARIS said in their announcement regarding the contact opportunities. ARIS says enthusiasm sparked by a school contact may also lead to an interest in ham radio among students and to the creation of ham radio clubs in schools. Some educators have even become radio amateurs after experiencing a contact with an ISS crew member. ARIS is celebrating 20 years of continuous amateur radio operations on the ISS. Contact ARIS US for additional information. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. While tower climbing safety is a topic of my segment on This Week in Amateur Radio, anything we can do to reduce the amount of trips up a tower leads to increased safety because you can't fall off a tower you don't climb. 
Over the years, as both the professional climber and a repeater owner, I learned from personal experience how important securing coax to the tower and antenna can be. Trial and error, experimentation, and failure mode analysis have been good teachers. When installing coax on any support structure, tower, or even an antenna mast on a chimney mount, how you secure the coax to the support has a direct effect on how long it will last without failure. First, you need to know what type of coax you're installing. Some are designed to be flexible, some are more rigid. Belden 9913 is somewhat rigid feed line, 9913 Flexi and the RG8 family are somewhat flexible, meaning they are designed to be wiggled from time to time. Another issue is the movement of the center conductor as the coax heats and cools with the passage of the sun. If you use cable TV hardline, this effect can be extreme. So we examine the route we intend to take with the feed line at both ends of the support structure. This can be very important when using the more rigid or more shrink prone feed lines. At the lower end, the more rigid coax needs support. The goal of the support should be to minimize or eliminate flexing caused by mother nature. In other words, by wind or weight of snow. In one installation, we used the length of three quarter inch conduit as the support between the tower and the ham shack to hang the coax and wires. Every installation is gonna be a little bit different. Now at the top of the coax, the route from the tower to the antenna is most critical because this end tends to move more than at the bottom. If your antenna is side mounted, keep the coax attached to something like the tower's cross members or whatever else is available to add support. What you want to do is avoid any section of coax that is hanging in the wind and able to wobble in the worst of storms. Over time, this is where failures are likely to occur. I also recommend a stress loop of coax near the antenna to allow for center conductor movement, and some folks believe this tends to trap much of the energy of a lightning strike. When you make a few loops of coax, be sure to secure different points of the loop to the tower, mast, or sidearm so it isn't flopping in the wind either. I have found that the more rigid coax with the foil shield, when flexed repeatedly, the foil cracks and when the wind blows, this can create a crackling interference sound in the received signal's audio. This can happen even when the coax has foil and wire braid outer conductor. So there it is in a nutshell. Support, support, support. Use flexible coax whenever possible, but avoid any unsupported runs vertically or horizontally at the top or at the bottom of the tower, mast, or whatever you're putting your antennas on. The more you secure and waterproof, the longer it'll last and the less you'll climb, which is safer. Remember to plan your antenna work around safety. Remember, Tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Here's this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars, a members-only benefit. To register, check out upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions, please visit the ARRL Learning Network webinar page. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded Learning Network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. Working the Pileup, presented by Ron Delpierre Smith, KD9 IPO, will be presented on Tuesday, October 5th, 2021, at 1 p.m. Eastern. That's 1700 UTC. Ron Pierre Smith, KD9 IPO, Vice President of the Chicago Suburban Radio Association and an ARRL Assistant Section Manager in Illinois, will offer an enlightening discussion on working a pileup from both sides of the contact. Whether your interest lies in ARRL Field Day, contesting, special events, or rare DX, this is a must-see presentation. Ron will discuss search and pounce and running techniques, when to use them, and some tips on working them to your advantage. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change. September was named National Preparedness Month by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, with dozens of organizations and agencies participating in drills. On the heels of this emphasis for citizen preparedness, ARRL's annual simulated emergency test takes place October 2nd and 3rd, as amateur radio operators show their readiness for emergencies and disasters. 
The Simulated Emergency Test, or SET, is an annual nationwide exercise designed to assess the skills and preparedness of the Amateur Radio Emergency Service volunteers, as well as those active in the National Traffic System, Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, Skywarn, Community Emergency Response Teams, and other allied groups. While the first week in October is normally scheduled weekend for the Simulated Emergency Test, Local and section-level exercises may take place throughout the fall. In addition to determining the strength and weaknesses in providing communications under simulated emergency conditions, the SET also provides a platform, like Field Day, for a public demonstration for service agencies and the news media regarding amateur radio's emergency capabilities. The simulated emergency test offers amateurs an opportunity to learn and practice useful skills in traffic handling, net operations, emergency communications protocols, and management. They can also update their go kits for use during deployments and ensure their home station's operational capabilities are ready for any emergency or disaster. Youngsters in South Africa's Vort Trekker organization mark their National Heritage Day by getting on the air and making some meaningful contacts. Fort Trekkers, part of South Africa's scouting movement that celebrates Africana heritage, were eager to get on the air to celebrate the organization's 90th birthday. With the help of Northern Cape Amateur Radio Club, ZS3NC, they spent five hours in the Cathu Field Station on September 24th working and logging amateurs from a number of provinces in South Africa and regions in Nambia. Roy Welsh, ZS3RW, S. May Walsh, ZS3EW, and Gerhard Koteze, ZS3TG, helped them add new names and call signs to the log of special event station ZS9OTVK, moving them even closer to qualifying for a communication badge. Said Roy, we had fun as well. In all, there were 60 contacts logged. Best of all, two youngsters now want more than just their badge. They're looking to take the exam and get their license. The South African Radio League reports that four logs received for the 5 MHz Worked All ZS award met the criteria to be considered for the organization's propagation study, which has been running for some time now. ZS Zulu Sierra is the callsign prefix for South Africa, by the way. The problem with propagation studies is that accurate data is required, and not the throwaway 5-9 signal report typical of contest exchanges. Considering the dates and the distances covered, it's unlikely that 99% of the contacts were truly 5-9 and 5-9+, plus, but contest logs tend to be set to default to a meaningless 5-9 report. For a more meaningful study, one would require much more information, such as local and distant station weather conditions, barometric pressure, state of the ionosphere, and the sunspot count, just to mention some. The primary reason for the submission of the logs was the application for the Worked All ZS award, and no conditions of what had to be included, other than a realistic RS report from both stations in the contact, was stipulated. Evaluating all the data, it was concluded that the log from Andre Botez, Zulu Sierra 2 Alpha Charlie Papa, came closest to the requirement for accurate signal reports. Andre's log also contained digital contacts with accurate signal strength reports. From the four logs evaluated, he also made the most contacts, 149 QSOs. The 2021 ARRL Handbook, donated by the South African Amateur Radio Development Trust, has been awarded to Andre and was recently shipped to him. The Federal Communications Commission has adopted rules that make 1200 MHz of spectrum in the 6 GHz band, 5.925 to 7.125 GHz, available for unlicensed use. These new rules will usher in Wi-Fi 6, the next generation of Wi-Fi, and play a major role in the growth of the Internet of Things. Wi-Fi 6 will be over two and a half times faster than the current standard and will offer better performance for American consumers. Opening the 6 GHz band for unlicensed use will also increase the amount of spectrum available for Wi-Fi by nearly a factor of five and help improve rural connectivity. The 6 GHz band is currently populated by, among others, microwave services that are used to support utilities, public safety, and wireless backhaul. Unlicensed devices will share the spectrum with incumbent licensed services under rules crafted to protect those licensed services and enable both 
unlicensed, and licensed operations to thrive throughout the band. The report and order authorizes indoor low-power operations over the full 1200 MHz and standard power devices in 850 MHz of the 6 GHz band. An automated frequency coordination system will prevent standard power access points from operating where they could cause interference to incumbent services. The further notice of proposed rulemaking seeks comment on a proposal to permit very low power devices to operate across the 6 GHz band to support high data rate applications including high performance wearable augmented reality and virtual reality devices. The notice also seeks comment on increasing the power at which low power indoor access points may operate. Unlicensed devices that employ Wi-Fi and other unlicensed standards have become indispensable for providing low-cost wireless connectivity in countless products used by American consumers. In making broad swaths of the 6 GHz spectrum available for unlicensed use, the FCC envisions new innovative technologies and services that will deliver new devices and applications to American consumers and advance the Commission's goal of making broadband connectivity available to all Americans, especially those in rural and underserved areas. Horseshoe crabs are more commonly found on beaches, not near major highways, but the world's largest horseshoe crab actually an oversized replica of one, is being celebrated in Hillsboro, Ohio as one of America's notable roadside attractions. The Highland Amateur Radio Association, K8HO, is getting into the act on Saturday, October 2nd by activating a special event station that calls attention to this crabbiest of curiosities. According to the Times-Gazette newspaper, Krabby, a pavilion-like structure made of fiberglass and foam, is 12 feet high and measures 28 feet wide by 67 feet long. That's a good bit larger than the real thing, which is no more than 19 inches. Hams will be on the air between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. local time. Successful QSOs will make radio operators eligible for a special certificate with a picture of Krabby. So for all your efforts getting through the pileups, you'll have nothing to crab about. And finally this week, there is an area in West Virginia that regulates the use of cell phones, wireless internet, and other devices that use electromagnetic waves, and it's considered the quietest place in the United States. The reason why the town of Green Bank has a national radio quiet zone put into place by the federal government is because it is home to an observatory. The Green Bank Observatory, formerly known as the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, was built in 1957 and features eight telescopes, including the Robert C. Byrd Green Bank Telescope, the largest fully steerable radio telescope on Earth. This gigantic telescope is 300 feet in diameter. The Federal Communications Commission created the National Radio Quiet Zone in 1958 to block potentially detrimental interference at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, as well as at the U.S. Naval facilities in nearby Sugar Grove. The zone covers 13,000 square miles in Virginia and West Virginia. Living in a radio quiet environment makes life in this part of the country a little different from the rest of the United States. For example, there's a general store in Arbavale in which customers leave sticky note messages for their friends and family on two conveyor belts, according to the New York Post. And those who live on the Green Bank Observatory site cannot use cell phones, cordless phones, Wi-Fi, microwaves, or even wireless speakers, reports resident Marilyn Krieger. That's because these types of devices can create interference with radio astronomical observations. The quiet zone is an appealing place for survivalists and those who claim to be sensitive to electromagnetic devices. Many of these people move to Green Bank and the surrounding areas to avoid the digital footprint that's so prominent in most areas of the country. In addition, it's a way for them to avoid some forms of modern technology. Some individuals are there because they feel their health is suffering from electromagnetic radiation. Many flock to the area simply because they don't want anyone to bother them. But there's also a positive component to the Radio Quiet Zone. 
For example, since the residents don't use cell phones, many substitute ham radios and are on scene to help with an incident even before law enforcement responds. You won't see any car accidents caused by drivers distracted by texting. It's not unusual to see phone booths and people using paper maps instead of GPS to navigate. Locals like living in the National Radio Quiet Zone and surrounding areas because it allows them to disconnect from devices and connect to nature, each other, and a simpler way of life. Instead of spending time online, they spend time outdoors with people in person. It's a quieter way of living in an increasingly connected world that could be very noisy at times. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Letter, the AWRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on nets and great repeater systems like our newest affiliates, the K2IWR repeater on 147.180 MHz in Cortland, New York, and the K2MST repeater on 443.150 MHz serving all of Syracuse, New York. We welcome them aboard the vast This Week in Amateur Radio network of repeaters and nets around the world. If your net or repeater carries This Week in Amateur Radio, why not let us know about it and we'll give you a free promo here on the air. All you need to do is put all the details into an email and give us the repeater call sign, frequency, area served, and the days and times that you carry This Week in Amateur Radio and send it off in an email to w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We'd be happy to hear from you. That address, once again, is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We hope to hear from you real soon. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73.